Hi everybody, welcome to the Filmmaker's Guide to the Galaxy. We are on episode Hello. 14. I'm here with James yeah. Bush, director, and DOP Newton Thomas Siegel, ASC. Welcome, Tom. How are you doing? Thank you, Tom, for coming on. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, well, we might as well get stuck in and um, people will join us uh, if and when, and they can leave their comments and reactions uh, below or on the side on YouTube. And feel free to ask any uh, questions as well. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, Tom, when, when when did you start off in the industry and what sort of projects were you working on at the very beginning? What did you get your teeth stuck into to kind of get your career off the ground? I, I started the, uh, kind of in the 70s. That was making little experimental films. Film, uh, I went to New York, New York uh, as a poet to Whitney Museum and sort of program. Uh, as a kid, though, you know, I was very naive, didn't know much. Um, and then I went to college up in uh, Massachusetts at a place called Hampshire College. Uh, I met someone who became my documentary partner, and um, we started making, after uh, that year at Hampshire College, we started making documentaries. And I spent a number of years traveling the world and shooting documentaries. Um, but I think in part my background from the art world always led me more toward a more controlled aesthetic um, of narrative. And uh, Haskell Wexler gave me the opportunity to shoot my first movie. Oh, really? Um, because he had seen the documentaries that I did and he wanted to do a document a, a feature that was um, really very much in line with one of the documentaries I did. So the Massive. first transition, significant transition I made from documentary into feature was with the film called uh, Latino in 1985 mm -hmm. that Haskell Wexler directed. Oh, right. He directed that. Okay. Well, okay. That's interesting. Because he, he was mainly a, a DP, wasn't he? So... But he, but he, he yeah, started he was, moving uh, into directing towards the end. Well, like, well he was a he, he, he was a legendary cinematographer, yes, course, uh, yeah. Oscar winning, um, you know, uh, uh, really one of the great all time cinematographers. But in the uh, '60s, he, he had made some documentaries. But in the '60s, he did a movie called Medium Cool, which was a very um, experimental and, and bold. Uh, film that took place during the time of the uh, all of this uh, civil strife around the Democratic National Convention, and he took the actors from his story and actually filmed them in the middle of these sort of riots and oh, wow. and and uh, uh, confrontations between protesters and and uh, police, and it was a really um, it, it's a quite remarkable film. Um, it's worth a, a look at medium cool. So um, when he asked me about doing this movie Latino, uh, it was, you know, I, it, it was an amazing opportunity. I mean, I, I was totally unqualified and, and just because I had shot these documentaries that he liked, uh, I don't know why he thought I was capable of doing this film, but it was, it was like my film school that, that, uh, that period. It was a very long shoot for a film that he financed himself, uh, and uh, Haskell didn't speak Spanish, and I did, so I went down early. And I spent months in Nicaragua where we shot, and just sort of prepping it and kind of figuring it all out because there was no film crew there. There was still a war going on. It was, yeah, yeah. It was kind of a crazy situation, but um, it, was a, it was a great uh, trial by fire show. Yeah, that, that was probably quite a, a crazy time to be down there because of the whole uh, the, the, uh, the the war going on and everything else, and the documentaries that have been made on that. You know, <laughs> thousands of documentaries about that <laughs> and the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we I had I knew the area because we had done documentaries in that area, and uh, by the time we did Latino, the um, the Samosa, the dictator in Nicaragua, had been overthrown. The Sandinistas were in power. Um, but there was a counter 
uh, revolutionary movement going on that was that was funded in great part by the CIA in the U.S. Um, so we had done this documentary where we traveled to the forefront, both with the Sandinistas and with the Contras. Uh, and then we put it together as a documentary about oh, cool. the, the civil unrest in Nicaragua. So it was still going on when we did the feature. And um, there was even a day when I remember we had a scene where we needed to uh, we needed to see the uh, impact of an attack of the Contras. And it was one weekend we heard about up north in a place called Matagalpa. There was uh, there was indeed an attack, uh, and they burnt down a bunch of silos, an agricultural cooperative. So we jumped in a jeep and we took off and we went. And we, you know, we we're supposedly doing this feature film, but uh, Haskell had these old CM3s, and I just grabbed a CM3 and I'm like, you know, going around and and uh, <laughs> shooting this <laughs> the real. The real event it was very bizarre. Yeah, yeah, I bet. The film, the film. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to Haskell, who was very much a, you know, a mentor. Um, but I, I do have to say that uh, the, the outcome of it, I don't think, you know, was a great film by any stretch. You know, the same boldness of a medium. And I think that was in part because uh, Haskell felt. He, he, he had something he wanted to say, and so he felt it had to be a more commercial, uh, uh, yeah. Kind of yeah. straightforward yeah. Uh, film than, uh, than he had with Medium Cool. Um, and uh, in hindsight, I think that's it's kind of a shame because, you know, uh, audiences are very sophisticated nowadays, and I think they, um, uh, they, they, they probably could have used a bolder approach but for me it was you know a life-changing experience and then you yeah it was did you just continue to do film after film up like you know smaller budgets and then the bigger you know you worked your way up the budget chain as it were well uh, eventually but you know latino didn't really get much of a, of a theatrical distribution and it wasn't a great film so it didn't exactly launch a uh, uh, career, but I did start doing a lot of second unit, um, and that was in part probably less um, a part of Latino and more a part of some of the documentaries that I did. So I'd say the next big kind of uh, um, uh, experience that I had in feature filmmaking was when I went to do Platoon. Right. Yeah. And Platoon, Platoon was... Uh, a film that I got uh, asked to do. I, I did it on it with um, uh, Bob Richardson was the yeah. first unit. Um, and uh, I think it was as much um, that I ended up uh, being asked for it on. Another great experience. Unit is the kind of thing that you can get a second unit credit for a week's work, and you can get a second unit credit for uh, you know six months of uh, of yeah. work. And uh, it's it, 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 each second unit experience can be radically different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, platoon was a very small budget and a very ambitious um, uh, uh, script, and so because of that, um, you know, I had the opportunity. To really make a you know huge contribution uh, in in the film, and so I, I think um, that was a, another great uh, experience that I had, um, and uh, I, I met you know Oliver of course, and and Bob Richardson became a lifelong friend and collaborator. So um, I say that would be, was my next um, you know significant experience but then that led to just more second unit right um and a little bit of television work so you know i spent a number of years kind of trying to get the picture and about another four or five, 
and then you know you do one thing leads to another and it leads to another and a lot of it is serendipity um you know hope it's more because of your talent but you know um all the talent in the world doesn't help if somebody doesn't see the movie or if the movie's yeah. no good yeah um yeah. As as Bob Richardson very uh, rightfully said, you know, I would rather uh, do, you know, okay work on a great film than great work on a bad film. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I'm starting to, to learn that. Um, I need to start, you know, picking and choosing projects as a DP. Um, I mean, I, was, I think, obviously, when you start out, I think it's good to get get the work and learn from the work. But then, obviously, after a while, you need to start picking and choosing. Otherwise, you're just going to continue being unseen aren't you well i you know if you can keep working you're doing great so <laughs> I, I i i would say that you know we all like to say that we only choose you know we're very careful about what we choose and we take the best projects because you know but the the fact of the matter is is nobody even with all the movies i've done nobody really has the pick of the litter you um and we're all junkies for shooting so everybody wants to keep working <laughs> yeah um so to a degree um you have to be careful about what you pick because you'll start to define your career but i think at the beginning of a career um you need to just you need to sh shoot just keep everything you can yeah uh, yeah you need, you need to meet people you need to make relationships you need to learn the technology you need to make mistakes you know um and sometimes making those mistakes on a smaller uh, uh, platform is a better thing than yes, when yeah, you make yeah. those mistakes on a, on a big giant movie because yeah. that gets ugly. That could ruin you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah you, you talk about like, you know, you, you're not too sure if that film's going to be a huge success or not, but one of the films you went on to do then was obviously The Usual Suspects, which became a big cult classic, didn't it? Um, when you read the script, did you think it was going to be like such an amazing? well-received film or, well, or you know, it's just usual, it was a good script and a great twist at the end that just got you hooked usual suspect was pretty early in my career and um i think i was excited just about doing a film it's a good script and you know great cast and, yeah. and it was yeah. like well you know what could possibly go wrong yeah. uh, and i think i was too naive and knew too little about uh you know i didn't go to film school really or anything and was a little too naive about what the feature for film world was mm. to even know like, Oh, this is going to be a big movie or this is going to be a little movie or this is going to be a successful movie. I just thought it's like, Oh, this is a cool story. Um, <laughs> and so I went and I did it, you know, uh, I think now, you know, I, uh, after years of experience, you start to realize oh, with these elements and this thing, this could be uh, this or, and this could be that. And a, a lot of it, you know, depends on what you're looking for in the outcome of a movie you do. Like, do you just, you know, want to have a movie that gets seen by millions sure. and millions of people? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or do you want a movie that you think, like, that's the kind of movie I would go see? Or, you know, so there's a lot of different um, desires that people have for the outcome of the work they do. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've done really huge movies. I've done little tiny movies. Um, I'd like to think that, um, I, uh, um, you know, I, I only, uh, you know, do films that I want to go see or that would yeah. be the kind of film that I would do, but it's, it's, you know, I, um, there's a lot of different reasons to do any given project, um, yeah. and they can vary from, from film to film. And even then, you know, you can look at all the elements in a film and there's very little guarantee what will happen later, you know? Yeah. Um, it, films are like lightning in a bottle and sometimes you catch it and sometimes you don't, even with the best talent imaginable. You know, I've done films with uh, incredible artists and actors and, that have barely gotten seen. So, you, you know, you, you never, you know, sometimes, you know, you do a Marvel movie and you, right. 
I know it's going to get promoted like crazy. I know it's going to yeah. have a big platform, but you know, you don't, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, on some of the ones that have been, uh, panned, you know, people, yeah, you know, nobody went in you can, thinking you can have great, gonna get panned. you can have great yeah. cast and great script, but then if the marketing plan is yeah. not right or it's a bad time of year, you know, you can be, you can be screwed and, and no one's, no one sees it. Yeah. Or it just doesn't work for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. You know, especially a lot of times if you're, if you're interested in kind of more bold or, or, or riskier filmmaking, that's the time when you really don't know if it's going to work. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Dri Drive was interesting that way because when I was doing Drive, you know, there was two financiers and it was Nick Reffin's first movie in Hollywood. And it was clear that he had a style that he wanted to do that was very lyrical. Yeah. Kind of slow and internal. And it was primarily a one camera show, but I gave him a fair amount of beating in post. We need to pace it up. And sure enough, one of the two financiers said that very vision he made and that's what went to Khan and got him the best director award and you know the film is extremely now yeah. and influential so you know that's a case where it was a riskier uh, endeavor or, 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 or ambition that he had and it worked out yeah you yeah because his, his other films tend to be quite you know they're they're quite slow pace and like long push-ins, that kind of thing. We had the DP on a few weeks back, you know, who shot um, Only God Forgives and Bronson. Oh, yes. And, um, and you know, he, and he was saying, yeah, he, he does like to do those kind of long, kind of menacing kind of shots um, to kind yeah. of draw the audience in. But obviously, sometimes people get bored by that unless there's something very entertaining yeah. happening. And I think with, yeah. scary with Drive, it had a good, a good mix-up of, of everything, really, because it... You had the, the the driving side, you know, the crashing and and a yeah. bit of action in there. It had it, almost every kind of element that I love yeah. in a film. You know, you've got the good actors, yeah. you've got the good script, you've got you know amazing cinematography with a noir, colourful noir look. Um, it had all those elements in place, which I think obviously got it got it those awards for sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with with Drive, actually, like. I, what did you what did you guys kind of reference and was it because like a lot of dps and directors now reference drive or things like that or blade runner very sort of distinctive yeah. looks is, is there anything you guys kind of referenced or that he referenced as a director that you went oh, okay i know what you i know what you mean i think uh you know we can draw on that well we looked at you know we looked at some of the uh classic car chases you know like uh you know french lieutenant bullet bullet yeah yeah, Ronin and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I it, it's kind of funny because what was your movie? Uh, but um, and I think maybe it was because we didn't really have a much stuff with him as I, I would have liked. Um, but I think for him, uh, you know, what was really important was capturing uh, L.A., that, that kind of urban neon side of uh, downtown mm -hmm. side of L.A. that you don't, you know, at least at that time, you didn't see that much in, uh, in Hollywood movies. And in the... Um, car sequences because there's really only a handful of actual like chase sequences or yeah, whatever yeah it was really important for him to give each one of them kind of its own personality and i think that's one of the reasons you know we looked at stuff even though we didn't have a lot of car chase stuff we looked at some of the big car chase movies um and you know it wasn't really something that he had ever done before you, you know his other movies um, we're not in those kind of movies. So, um, 
you know, we spent a fair amount of time talking about how to do that. And, um, you know, as an example, the opening of the movie is we decided the movie Drive about a guy named Driver who has no name, really, who just wants to be behind the wheel. Let's be behind the wheel with him from the beginning and not let you out of the car. So that whole sequence in, in, in the opening, once he gets in the car and he's on the job, um, I violated it once or twice with an aerial, if I remember. But it's basically all told from inside the car. So that was its personality. Yeah. You know? For, for, things, um, for things like that, on, obviously they've changed now a bit because um, it was nine years ago or ten years ago. But um, do you, did you just tend to have that on a low loader or a stunt car or something and then have the camera inside or... Do you, like, do you tend to add lights onto that as well and then just have the natural street lights go past in the background? Like, what's your kind of method? What was your method back then for doing that? Well, it's funny because um, Drive was shot right when the Alexa came out. and Yeah, that was my next question. Bob <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bob Richardson was actually using it on Hugo. And they, um, I, I had done Superman, which was like the first Genesis, Panavision Genesis digital movie. And that was sort of like my digital experience. I did a little digital movie right after that. But then I went back to shooting film for a number of years. And I thought the Genesis was really interesting. It, was a, it, it had amazing potential. Um, but I enjoyed shooting film, and that's what I knew. And, and then when the Alexa came out, and I got the chance to use it on drive. That was like a game changer, yeah. I thought, for me. Yeah. And it was such a low light level that it let me do, that it could expose that. It could let me do things that I, I couldn't do otherwise. That I tried to do on Superman. I sort of did, you know, super low light levels. And, you know, it, it, it was barely got away with it. But with the Alexa, it was all of a sudden a whole new host of opportunity opened up and in the prep i went out um, i wanted to do a test see if i could really get away with what i thought i could so we took the driver's car and we rigged every at that time little tiny light i thought i would potentially use leds incandescent fluorescents all different kinds of little lights all over and around the car, on a rack on the roof, inside the car, like everywhere. And we wired them all. Uh, Tony Nako, my brilliant gaffer, um, filled the trunk with inverters and dimmers and wireless control of the dimmer. And Tony got in a van behind me and we were on headsets. And I actually got Ryan Gosling to drive around in his and he was wearing his costume oh nice and right. Ryan being the kind of actor he yeah. was was really <laughs> cool guy <laughs> he was in character yeah and I can tell you I did that I think it was like two nights and days and just drove really? everywhere all over LA it was just <laughs> us the van and this car and the footage was amazing like I w he would pull up to a stoplight and I could see on his face the color changing yeah. when it would go from red to green. It was like, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually, a lot of that footage is used in the film. Oh, really? Okay. Brilliant. So, you were you, you <laughs> now, lighting the full color your, as well? But to answer your question, yeah. <laughs> that was our test in our prep day. Now we're really shooting. The movie started, and we have you know, permits and insurance and producers and all of this stuff. All of a sudden, I can't shoot like that. I have to have it towed or I have to have it on a process <laughs> trailer. And it's like, oh, God. So we use the same technology in terms of the, you know, but it was uh, a, a lot less Natural. freeing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you can obviously do, you, you know that you can now get those things where the person's on top and then they can... It's, you don't need the trailer as much, but obviously that just depends on where you yes, are. Yes, and uh, what, what we call the pod car, That's it, the biscuit yeah. car, is, is a bunch of different names. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a fantastic 
And we actually used a very early version of that on, um, uh, on Drive. Yeah. Um, we used it for some of the stuff out in the desert. Um, we used it a co- couple times um, uh, so that Ryan could actually be in the car when we did some of the, the heavier duty stunts. So were you actually, you were you still lighting then? Because um, obviously, like, yeah. I mean, I've done some night stuff and I've just used one fluorescent um, or Astra tube, you know, and I just had that. Yeah. And then I've just let all the natural light, like you said, just flood in and kind of, especially in a busy city, you know, you get a lot of, a lot of lights and you don't really need too much. It just depends you know, no, where you are. It's, it's extraordinary what, what you can do. And, and, you know, in part it was, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, we really wanted to capture that sort of gritty downtown you know, sodium vapor, mercury vapor kind of feel to LA. So um, I wanted to work at a light level where all of the, the influence of the um, existing light could, could have an impact. Mm. Um, the reason I mentioned all those different lights was that was really more just about seeing which of those lights Okay. Work the best. Did you use Did you use that many do. in the end, or was it just like a, a, oh, no, a simple no. fill? Or? You know, we, yeah, we narrowed it down to what we wanted. Um, we would use a, a range because sometimes you would want to go from like a um, uh, you know just a sort of a soft little dashboard glow to yeah. you know a, a more of a hard sweeping light or you know that's coming off and on. Um, so and we tried to also. You know, I have some kind of rhythm with the street light. So when you're looking out the window, like if you see sodium vapor over there, or if you see mercury vapor over there, we could, you know, do a little dance. Okay. Uh, dimmer dance between the color of the lights. That's that a really good, using. a really good idea. I like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the you know it, it became a little amazing at how much I could utilize that natural light. Yeah, and, definitely. You know, orig- in my original lens package, I, I had Cook S4s. And then I had a set of Master Primes that I was going to use for all the night stuff because I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go wide open to yeah. like a 1.3. Yeah. I never needed it. Oh, really? I never shot. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah you, ah. it, there was that camera. I probably went too far. But, you know, Were you at 1600 or fur- it, past that, or um, you know, I didn't. I stayed at 800. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, I you know maybe I did. I find, some I of the find, I've, I've still got it the Alexa Classic. Yeah. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I, I have the Alexa Classic, and it's um, I've had it for a few years, and uh, obviously mine's pretty old now. <laughs> but um, like yeah, it can get quite noisy, you know. Uh, although I like the noise, it's, you know, it looks like a lot like film grain, um, yeah. and it behaves nicely. But um, it definitely, definitely, it's even like a bit noisy. Eight hundred, you know, twelve, twelve eighty, whatever. You know, it is. It's not the cleanest of cameras, but then I think that's the quality of why people have always liked it. You get that subtle grain. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's know. a, it's a, it's a really the question of grain and noise is, is a, I, I think, a fascinating one. <laughs> that... I won't call it grain. <laughs> well, no, it, because. You know, Kodak spent a hundred years trying to reduce the grain in film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cinematographers kept saying, "Oh, it's grainy. Oh, this is too grainy. Yeah, yeah. And that's too grainy." And they really got film to be super fine grain right around the time that digital came in. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And then digital came in, and everybody said, "Like, oh, it's too clean." Well, yeah. yeah. And well, now it's eight K, and it's way too clean for me. I mean, I I still like yeah. a bit of a, a bit of grain. I, I think that's why a lot of people are still shooting on the Alexa and, and Alexa, well, Alexa minis, or or you know yeah. XTs or full 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 frame or sixty five because they they prefer the base level of the eight hundred. Whereas obviously with yeah. the Venice, you've got the dual ISO, and it's a bit cleaner. Um, you know, yeah. and things are 8K or whatever on the reds. So they are, you obviously smaller, you know, noise or whatever you want to call it on the eight when it's 8K. And I think that's, I think people who like film and love film are tending to stick, I've noticed, to the sort of 800 ISO and not shooting 8K. 
um, just because they like to see that that noise and grain. Well, the, I think you have to be careful because I think that film grain and video noise are two different things. Oh, yeah. You know, um, the you know to go back to the Genesis when I when I used the Genesis on uh, Superman, I had a really interesting conversation with my colorist uh, where. You know, you're saying, oh, you know, look how much better the blacks are in film than in the Genesis. And at first I was like, I'm not sure what you're talking about, because that Genesis black is a solid, rich black. And he said, yeah, there's no color in it. And then I realized what he meant, which was that the Genesis black was actually in some ways a blacker black than what you had on film mm. because the film black was still made up of little pieces of grain yeah. that are all you know floating yeah. around and those grain have color yeah so even though it's a black there's that that there's color depth to it sure. whereas the genesis at that time and the alexa's not like that but the genesis was just a black yeah it's like just a yeah. void of of information it was literally like there's nothing there so um I, I think it's a it, it, it's an interesting question, and there's a company you know called Live Grain. Yes, it has really made an art out doing of very good stuff. Yeah, putting out what we call a filmic grain into digital images, mm. as opposed to just noise. You know, Michael Mann. I know um, uh, I'm going to get in trouble here, but on the Miami Vice movie, I know they tried to introduce uh, electronic. Or, or, gr or the concept of grain with uh, by, by over amping the electronic yep. um, uh, side of the camera. And um, a lot of people just felt it was just, you know, like look like bad video. So it's a really, it's a, it's a video noise is it, is, is an interesting conundrum. <laughs> and you know, it's texture is something because really grain is about texture, right? Yeah. It's just like, smoke and stuff like that and and filtration and it's something that i've always been very jealous of still photographers because they can do amazing texture grain or you know stuff that really gives a like that but when we do it it moves yeah so when you have grain in a you know in a beautiful robert frank photo uh, you know it's a very different thing than grain in your film that's doing this hmm. right? so um it's 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 an interesting question and it'll be interesting to see how long it lasts because as the decades go on and more people like you are the filmmakers that we're watching who have never had a film experience or or really grew up not even going to the cinema maybe as much, but spending more time, you know, streaming on Netflix mm -hmm. and HBO and get used to a really clean, glossy kind of image, um, even without the flares and all that. Uh, it, there, we could be headed toward a place where it's no longer seen as, you know, aesthetically beautiful. Yeah. Be, uh, I'll be really curious. I'll be dead and gone, but to see what you know people are thinking like 30 years yeah i think it's getting close to that a lot a lot yeah. of big well certain certain films are, are definitely too too you know so ultra clean i'm just it kind of looks a bit like they're wrapped in cellophane or you know something <laughs> like mannequins in a shop window or something it <laughs> kind of just so crisp yeah. and clean you like you know <laughs> The, a bit like the debate over the 24 frames and the 48 frames and you know they've tried introducing that and it just for us it's like that just looks wrong yeah but in 20 30 years you know it might be like people looking back at 24 might be like that just looks wrong but isn't it it's just yeah. a, i guess it would change in times yeah definitely yeah i mean you, you can look at it the way it, it's funny you know my, my I have a uh, 14 year old twins and when they were born, um, we never had a television. We just had a home theater, but when they were born, we didn't even let them watch that. They, they saw no computers, no baby Einstein's, no videos, nothing. So they were about five. And 
um, the first movie they saw was the Georges Méliès Trip to the Moon okay. uh, in 1903, I think it was. And every week we had you know, movie night, and I worked them through film history, through you know, uh, black and white, into um, you know, talkies, into color, little by little by little. And I mean, I can tell you that they were maybe five ish. They watched Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, which is an hour and a quarter long black and white non narrative film about Moscow waking, waking up. It was made, a silent movie. It was made in 19, in the 20s, I believe, right after the revolution. And they were glued to mm. the screen. You know, we projected it, but they were glued hour and a quarter and uh you know i got up to i think around the red shoes i think was the movie last movie then i went off on a movie and my wife showed them a pixar movie and game over you know, I, th I think today you know, to get them to watch something in black and white. It, that is, yeah, it's you probably the, you did it the right yeah. way. At least show them something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hopefully they have a little bit of an appreciation. Maybe as they get older, they'll come I'll back around a little it, bit. Yeah. But you know, I mean, I mean, cinema is a learned language. Yeah. When the Lumiere brothers, uh, you know, shot uh, the train coming into the station, and people ducked because they were afraid they were going to get hit by the train. Uh, you know, we taught people how to interpret moving images, and we still do it. Yeah, we're still doing it. You know, uh, every movie you make is another contribution to the way we perceive, you know, visual storytelling. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, James, uh, yeah. I think you're you're up next on the next question. Yeah, I was going to say another great film <clears throat> you worked on, obviously, was Three Kings with. Uh, great cast and director uh, that had a very specific look to it as well that you created uh can you talk us through your thoughts and decisions and how you went about creating that look you had like a yeah. the beach by bypass if you mean, wasn't it, into the into the print afterwards was it the uh three kings was done the opening of three kings at the military base uh was done with uh, a skip leech process in the negative not in the print, in the negative, actually. Right, okay. And then when the guys leave the military base and they go on their adventure to look for the gold, it goes to a cross process, which was uh, shooting um, uh, uh, basically slide film and developing it as uh, ECN negative. Um, and, the you know, we were really looking for something which both reflected the, that look of Iraq during the war, which was actually very, it was kind of overcast. And it was a w w weird look. And also we wanted an impact when they left it, sort of the safety and the comfort of the military base. And for the first time they were really experiencing a direct interaction with the local population and a very different culture than their own. Um, the part of the choice, to be honest, for me, was I want to build stuff into the negative. I want a commitment, because we're going to go for a bold look, and I want to do it where there's no way back. Right. You know, that, that, that uh, the, 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 those processes, doing them in the negative, you, you know, you can't change your mind later and go, you know what, this whole cross-process thing, maybe I don't like it. Well, too bad, because it's there. And I have to say, I was, it blew my mind that Warner Brothers let us do it. Yeah, it's quite a, um, quite a bold yeah. look, but I think it, like you said, it just really worked with the desert and yeah, the, the harsh sunlight just one, and everything else. One quick aside, yeah. um, at one o'clock, I... I actually have to leave to go work on my digital intermediate. So you'll keep an eye we'll on the We'll keep an eye on the time. No problem. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but yeah, no, so, that, that, um, that film totally worked with that. And I think 
and I, I myself have, have definitely stolen that sort of look <laughs> and I think it's I, I, I wish you guys I'm sure you haven't seen it projected and I wish you could see a film print of it because the oh, film print uh, you know I, we, we did the best we could to carry that look into the digital world but the film print of it is I might is have seen it in the cinema I can't remember I, I, I might that's, have seen it that, that's great yeah um, so you went on to you did Three Kings and um, and then you, you started working on a few X Men films. Like um, the first one was in two thousand, which is obviously um, around the uh, Alexa stage. Were you shooting on the Alexa for that, or was that that was all film, wasn't it? The first two. Uh, yes, the first two were all on film. Okay, and and in terms of creating that new sort of superhero landscape that you know we we now know as DC and Marvel and everything else and X Men is that you know how did you go about making that world a little bit more grown up and not mm. not people running around in leotards and tights but more <laughs> um, you know those darker kind of more adult grounded you know reality yeah, yeah. well there's a there's actually a line in the film about I think I can't remember what is. it is now yeah, yeah. where Hugh Jackman makes yeah. it, yeah. makes a joke about what he wanted because he's like, I don't want to do this yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, really, that's Brian Singer. Uh, Brian, when he took on the X Men film, you know, I think he really wanted to treat it like a like a like a drama, mm. you know, like a realistic drama. And um, it was supposed to be in the like undefined future, but he he really he wanted little hints of it, like he insisted on sixteen by nine televisions when it, in those days there was virtually none. Everybody was four okay. by three still. But he wanted it to be like you would shoot a regular drama, to, to treat the characters like real people, to treat the environments with, you know, uh, um, realistic lighting, uh, albeit dramatic. So for me, I just treated it like I was doing a drama. And it, it, the, the movie... Uh, you know, thematically, the, the first X-Men uh, to me was the battle between Malcolm X, the ideological battle between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, mm. and uh, as represented by Professor X and Magneto, and um, which 20 years later is still the same theme of the movies. Yeah. That's another story. <laughs> um, but the thing is, uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, I approached it from uh, a realism point of view even when some of the sets were more fantastical but you know what would be the source of light what's the natural you know source to this sure and um i think that aesthetic really was sort of uh, um, a, a directive that everyone you know from um john meyer who did the sets to to louise mingenbach who did the costumes and it was all, you know, at that point, there, the whole concept of comic book movies was very nascent, and there's very little examples of it before that X-Men movie. And I think one of the contributions that that first X-Men made was that it said, well, we can actually have a serious movie yeah. that, you know, adults can enjoy as much as, as kids. Definitely. Definitely. Changed it, didn't it? For, yeah. For, like all of them going forward. Yeah. It, it set the bar, I think, very high. And, um, yeah. and, it, and it, you know, it, I don't know about the, the ones since then, you know, X Men has just got stronger. And you did one not too long ago um, that was, I think, one of the best ones yet. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm a big fan of them. I think they're just getting stronger. Mm. Um, okay. So I think we'll, we'll jump ahead to um, a few of your, your more recent films that have come. You've had two come out in the last six months. On Netflix, <laughs> uh, just, just in time for a just pandemic. in time for everyone to watch them. Yeah, <laughs> you know they thought to have theatrical releases, but uh, that didn't happen, did it? No, so, I think the things will change in that regards um, for yeah. sure. Um, I was just going to quickly ask about on on the uh, the Five Bloods. You know what? You obviously use different um, cameras and aspect ratios. Can you just run us through that and when you used, you obviously shot on 16 mil and I think the Alexa 65, is that right? And as, as well as the mini? 
Uh, we shot on the LF. Yeah. The and sixteen millimeter. Right. Okay. So when was it in the jungle that you shot the LF? Because I definitely noticed it went pretty, you know, wide sort of scale at that point. As soon as they went in, Actually, yeah, the ratio kept changing, didn't it? For the it was the, the, the 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 aspect ratio history of the five blood follows. <laughs> Spike and I talked about all the flashbacks with Storm and Norman, and we decided that 16 millimeter reversal, um, predominantly handheld or running gun, was the way to shoot all of those flashbacks, because that's exactly what we would have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we were a news camera team. In Vietnam, yeah. shooting with the soldiers. Yeah, it's what the archival footage looked like. It's what I started my career as. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're going to do that, why not stay true to the four by three aspect ratio? Because that's what all the television news reportage, and you can see it in the archival footage. All the archival yes. footage was. So now we've already broken the rigidity of what aspect ratio has to be. And uh, I knew it was going to be on Netflix. So I knew that ultimately it would be within a 16 by 9 uh, delivery format, mm -hmm. whether it's a, you know, a, your OLED or, you know, Curl LCD TVs. screen or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, we had this idea that when the Bloods first arrive in Vietnam and they're in Ho Chi Minh City, which is a very modern, vibrant, uh, active uh, city that has really changed radically in the last uh, 50 years. Um, we would go widescreen. We shot with the, the modern, we used modern right. zoom. And then when they hit the jungle, and they started, started to become immersed in and surrounded by and enveloped in their memories and their sort of trip back in the rain. We would take five, go to the mini and go to the DNA lenses, which are really sort of older, more, now we say a vintage lenses that had a lot more imperfections and uh, uh, odd characteristics than the modern ingenue zoom. So was that the uh, mini LF or the mini just super 35? No, no it was just oh, okay. the, the, I was happy about was like a little less resolution yeah. stuff compared to the, to the, the, city. To the city. Yeah. And we went to 185, but the, the interesting thing about when it gets shown on Netflix is that the 185 doesn't mean you move in from the side, but it actually means you open the top and bottom. Yeah, yeah. So ironically, the canvas or the, the the you know the amount of imagery that you're seeing is greater it, it felt very because you know? I, when i watched it i noted down i was like oh the jungle must be the lf or the six, alexa 65 or something <laughs> because it feels a lot you did you use wider lenses as well obviously for the close-ups and things and because it felt like you're really uh, immersed and i don't know if it's obviously just the black bars being removed but it did yeah. feel like there was something that was Different. Yeah. It was like, right. like the other way around to what you did. <laughs> um, you know, we, we did use probably wider lenses in the jungle. But, you know, here's the thing is that when you're using a smaller sensor, you're effectively using a longer focal length, you know, or your field yeah. of view, yeah. shall we say. Yeah. You know, the characteristics of the lens don't change, but, no. but the field of view does. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was definitely... Um, it's strange, yeah. I didn't think you'd have, would have shot it that way around, but like it worked really well, especially. Right. I mean, one of one of the great things about digital projection, you know, and digital capture, is that we're really not locked into any aspect ratio. You know, I mean, you can be two point three if you want, and um, there's no reason not to be, um, other than getting it both ways. Most world, but by and large, it's it's, it's there's a lot more creative freedom when it comes to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I um, also was tr quickly trying to squeeze in uh, a question about Extraction, your other film on Netflix. Uh, what was it like having uh, a director that wanted to get behind the camera uh, for like that particular one take sequence? And how did you go about I didn't have to jump off of roofs. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, here's the thing is Sam Hargrave, who's like, you know, an action genius. We had him on the show yeah. a few weeks back. Yeah, lovely guy. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's extraordinary. And he had done Atomic Blonde with his, you Down know, the one sequence. shot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, incredible fight sequence that he operated himself. Um, and he's got a great eye. You know, I knew that from our prep. And, and he said to me up front, he said, look, this wonder I really want to do myself because I know the action. I know what the camera has to do. And I was like, you know what? You go for it. You know, you <laughs> You're the jump off that roof. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, you get on that, uh, on, on the, uh, Polaris, uh, and, I that. In, and, uh, and, uh, I just hope you're still standing when we get to the end. And, uh, he trained as a stunt man and he, he's a, an extraordinary athlete. I mean, I, uh, he, in my greatest hand now days ever, I don't think I could have done what he did. <laughs> yeah. yeah and how did you go about the lighting for that? Like, did you have to rely on mainly natural lighting and some few hidden lights here and there? Uh, well, there's there's a whole variety, you know. I mean, the because um, they go in. It's not just cars, you no, know. They no, go in no. and out of uh, housing complexes and stuff. So there's. There's very definitely lighting. You know, the automobile lighting was a struggle because we had a lot of shots where the camera's outside and it goes into the window of the car. And so you don't want to, you know, you, you don't have any place to really put lights. Uh, and it was a struggle to always get, you know, because you want to hold the outside too, even with the amazing dynamic range of the, of, of, um, you know, the, we were actually using on that the Panavision DXL and the Red Monstro. Even with that dynamic range, you know, you, you need to build up the interior to see outside or vice versa. And you couldn't be MDing a window that you're putting no. the camera through. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the great tools was the light mat, you know, yeah, where um, I could literally, you know, it's like a blanket and you could just jam it right up in the ceiling. Um, and, you know, I would always try to figure out what angle the camera was coming in at and where we could hide like just a little exactly. zinger from here or there but the the transitions in and out of the cars were brutal so in terms of the um in terms of going from like outside to inside and inside to outside and all these different rooms obviously then exposure is going to change drastically um and well we all know it's not done actually in one take. You know, it's like 12 sequences or whatever. But um, there, were there quite a few occasions you were constantly having to do yourself or an AC was having to change the exposure? Every shot. Yeah. Every, uh. so almost every shot, every piece in that <laughs> yeah. had exposure pulls. Yeah. Uh. And, you know, it's tricky because in, in digital, well, it's actually less tricky, but... Digital, I tend to be conservative about them because you do have so much range yeah. in the in the digital negative, you know. Um, so I, I I tend to be conservative about the stop pull because I do some of it in post, and if I do too much in camera, I'm too obvious. Fighting it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and you said you shoot you were shooting the um, action stuff on the smaller Monstro, weren't you? Versus the the DXL two. Yeah for the drama stuff, but uh, yeah. what was that? Uh, I, I, How did you for, find that for, in the 8K and because, stuff? Because Sam, you know, had designed this incredible wonder and, and we wanted to, you know, really keep the camera small and fluid. Um, uh, Trevor Loomis, our uh, focus puller, was really great about helping me put together um, this like the, the smallest most nimble camera package that we could um so the monstro is great because the um you know the media is inside the camera the um uh, i used the leica m series or m mount you know the old leica yeah. lenses because they're literally like you know that that big yeah um so the whole 
package was about 14, 15 pounds and was, wow. you know, barely beyond the monstro itself. Yeah. Incredible. And, and did you, um, we were talking about pixels and things like that earlier, well, noise and stuff. How do you find that shooting on the DXL2 and the monstro and the uh, resolution and, you know, think, things like that? Were you just, did you add a bit of grain in post, uh, live grain in post for that? Uh, I didn't add much in post because the action, the, uh, the environments that we were shooting in were so filled with uh, dust and dirt and haze yeah, and that smoke and everything. Anyway. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was inherent. A lot of it was really built into the, uh, the great photography. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I mean, you know, the cameras, the DXL, Monstro. The Alexa, the Sony Venice. I mean, these cameras now are getting closer and closer together in terms of the image that they put out. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, the camera choice comes down almost more to the user friendliness of it for whatever particular film you're going to do. And the lens choices are starting to have a bigger impact yeah, yeah. Uh, from one uh, package to another than the actual camera yeah or the skin you know rendering or whatever that the camera might um have yeah um i think we'll we'll wrap it up there yeah um tom because um you have to head off but is there any sort of final i do i have one more movie to get out to you guys and i gotta go color it. <laughs> I know, well i'm sure we'll be in grading a, we'll be in lockdown creating a movie now to watch <laughs> uh grading a movie now called cherry okay the russo brothers directed that uh, I hope you oh, all yeah. get to see one day. Well, hopefully yeah, in the cinema yeah. as well. That. Hopefully the cinema, yeah. Hopefully. Um, we'll see what happens. Is there any final advice you'd like you'd like to give to young cinematographers who might be watching or watching this in the future? Is there something that springs to mind that yeah. you have? Yes, I would advise you to wear a mask. <laughs> Apart from that. <laughs> And when you're wearing your mask, um, you know, say the cliches, but they're true. Shoot. Just go out there and shoot all you can. Um, but also work on sets. You know, get yourself on a set as a loader, as a, as, a, as, a, as a trainee, whatever it is you can do. If Find collaborators. Find mates that, um, not just shooters, but people that want to make movies and make movies with them. Uh, if you have a, a, you know, an iPhone and a laptop, you have a film studio. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, get out there and make stuff, make mistakes, learn, find people you like to work with. It's a very collaborative medium. Um, and study, watch all the movies that you can possibly see, and really look at them. Watch it once, and then watch it again with the sound off. And look at how it's mm, cut. Yeah. Look That's at how, yeah, every cinematographer should spend time in the editing room because you're not making pretty pictures you're telling a story yeah. um you need to know how it's cut uh, don't you really you, you need to know what e editing means you need to know what storytelling means and how to tell it with, with pictures yeah. not just you know not just get you know an old vintage lens and and flare it out and shoot a silhouette you know yeah um so it's it's uh um i i think that you know, keep working as much as you can on anything you can, whether it's uh, a no budget, you know, music video or a friend's student film. Uh, um, every time you work, every time I work, I learn something. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for your wise thank words you of that. wisdom. You're very welcome. And, um, <laughs> and thank uh, you, everyone. Wear your mask. <laughs> we will, we will. <laughs> Take care, and thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. Bye. -bye. Bye.